my name is Ramina Eskakzai and I'm a Ukrainian journalist. We are on a Munich Security Conference YouTube studio and here is my guest Kaya Kalas, the Prime Minister of Estonia. Kaya, I uh, take interview from a front line and I have a video question from our soldier. Can I show it to you? Absolutely. My name is Oleg. I'm a deputy commander of Mechanized Battalion, uh, 32nd Mechanized Brigade. I would like to express our appreciations to your country and personally to you uh, for support of uh, Ukrainian people and our armed forces. Miss Kaya, at the Nova days, uh, more and more often coming threats uh, from Russian politicians on their TV channels towards Baltic countries. Do you take this threat seriously? Is Estonia prepared for that? And do you understand that we may fight side by side against Russia in the future? We should do everything that uh, we don't have to discuss that. That's why we have to send all the military aid to Ukraine uh, right now so that we are able to end this war uh, now. Uh, we have to concentrate our efforts, not only the military aid, but also the political uh, pressure on, on Russia and also economical pressure on Russia, because then the breaking point for this war might not be that far. Of course, we are also uh, preparing for our own defense, uh, and that goes for the whole of Europe, I think. Everybody should should wake up. Uh, what are the lessons from the 1930s? Uh, there are three lessons. One lesson is that how fast everything spread in Europe. We are a small continent, so it, this affects everybody. The second is that uh, you know America tried to be uh, you know isolated. It didn't work. Uh, they paid higher price later on. And third is that when you don't uh, stop the aggression immediately. Uh, you know, all the aggressors or would-be aggressors in the world are uh, taking notes and starting their own fights against their neighbors. So this is very important that we are able to stop this now. Do you feel a pressure from the Russian Federation to stop supporting Ukraine? You personally were declared wanted in the Russian Federation. Of course, uh, they want us, uh, uh, you know, refrain from the decisions uh, uh, we would otherwise make. Uh, they want us uh, to be intimidated, uh, to be afraid. But uh, the only response to this is that we shouldn't be afraid. In Estonia, 25% of the population speak Russian. There is also the city of Narva where 6,000 people live who speak Russian. This is the largest Russian-speaking community in the European Union. Through the bridge, you can get to the territory of the Russian Federation. This is a city that Putin could theoretically want to invade in order to call to protect the Russian-speaking population in Estonia. What are you doing to declare Russia culture and the influence in your state? First of all, uh, uh, it must be understood that in 1920s, our Russian-speaking minority was 3%, 3. So how the Russians operate is that they deported Estonians, my own family was deported to Siberia, and import Russians. So by the end of occupation, it was over 30. So why I'm saying this, it's not, you know, a native uh, um, minority that we have had uh, in such big numbers. But uh, coming to today, I mean, uh, we try to focus on our common future, uh, not our past. So our Russian-speaking minority is not the homogeneous group. Uh, the divide uh, goes between older generation and younger generation. So younger generation, they are for Ukraine, helping Ukraine. They clearly see there's one aggressor, one victim. But the older generation who came to Estonia uh, when we were occupied, uh, they want this time back when they were the masters of our land. Um, but um, uh, our Russian-speaking minority, I think it's less vulnerable uh, because they clearly see uh, what happened in Kharkiv, for example, when Russians come to 
liberate them, they are the first ones to lose their homes and families to the war. So, so they uh, are clearly understanding that the life uh, on the European side is so much better than the life on the Russian side. Um, and uh, there is also a fact uh, when we closed the Russian propaganda channels when the war started, then clearly, I mean, for Estonian speaking, minor, uh, Estonian speaking population, it was very clear that, uh, you know, 90, over 90 percent, it was even 97 percent, you said, you know, Russia attacked Ukraine. That is very plain and simple. For Russian-speaking minority, it was not that clear. Uh, some said it's NATO is at fault, some said Ukraine, some said somebody else, uh, and some said, of course, Russia. But now, when we closed the propaganda channels two years ago, then, you know, Month by month, we saw these numbers going uh, so that they were in our information sphere and they understood what is going on. How do you assess the real changes of Ukraine to become a part of European Union and NATO? Do you see the changes in the fight against corruption in our country and other positive changes? Uh, yes, um, uh, you know, in 1990s, so when we got uh, our freedom back in Estonia, there was this short opportunity window where people were literally holding hands and, and ready to do very necessary reforms. And maybe I have to explain this to Western colleagues. Uh, this uh, Russian occupation normalized corruption, so it was okay to steal from the state. When we got our freedom, our country back, it was not okay to steal from the state. So, so um, Russian occupation normalized corruption. Whereas, you know, when it's your taxpayers' money, it's your country that uh, you're building. The change didn't happen in Ukraine in 1990s. But I really feel that this is the moment now. There is this uh, opportunity window where actually, you know, Ukrainians who are fighting for their own land also understand that, you know, corruption is stealing from the country that we actually, you know, all need and the country that we have been fighting for. So I really, uh, really um, uh, hope that Ukraine is taking those reforms very seriously the rule of law, all the reforms uh, that are necessary to do for the accession of European Union. We did it. It's not really negotiation. It's more like really uh, uh, doing, uh, taking all the boxes and, and doing the necessary things. Of course, it's difficult. That requires people really uh, to put an effort. But I think that also Ukrainians now have this uh, really this chance where, where, you know, despite of the political uh, views, because you also have, you know, social democrats and, and conservatives and everywhere, liberals, but, but despite of your political views, people understand that we need to do this and they support them. So, so, I mean, we are ready to help you on the way because we have been through this process, but I really uh, recommend to take this very seriously. There is a discussion in our society about the Ukrainian victory. Some experts say we need more people, while others said we need more weapons. For example, long-range artillery. What is your opinion on that? Well, of course, uh, we listen to what Ukrainians are telling us, uh, uh, what you need from us. Uh, so you need ammunition, you need artillery, you need equipment. Uh, that is very, very clear. Uh, how you decide yourself uh, because of the uh, uh, war that is going on, of course, uh, this is up to yourself uh, to decide how you can uh, defend the country the best. So thank you very much for support mm -hmm. Ukraine. Thank you for your time. Thank you.